extremists. There'll be comments that's like, that's not red pill. He's blue pill. Don't listen to him. Uh, I did porn for a little bit. Not, I'm not doing that anymore. You're not doing that anymore? No, no, you're still doing that. Before, I'm still right? doing that, man. <laughs> you're making me tear up, man. I think it's going to be kind of a banger. It is a banger of questions. Every girl is going to break my heart, so there's no point in you know, being with anyone. If I hadn't met Julia, things would not have played out as they did. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Don't Be Sour show. I'm your host, Max Tuning. This is episode number four with David De Las Morenas, otherwise known as How to Beast. What's up, man? What is going on, bro? How you doing? I'm excited to be here, man. You know, with, with Heidi's last uh, interview, uh, we had some upgrades in the studio, and I've made some, some more upgrades for you. Uh, people commented that the water bottles were very tacky looking. So now we have some shaker bottles, big upgrade. Nice. And then uh, Mona, one of my fantastic team members, got us these custom shot glasses. As you're aware, we take a shot to start the episode, kind of loosens you up. I feel like everyone listening doesn't get the same enjoyment as the people watching. Everybody take a shot. But today we have the Avion Reserve 44. That was a lovely gift by yourself and your fiance. Now, this is probably going to be a really classy tequila, but probably going to taste terrible. And you're not allowed to take a chaser, dude. This is just, we do it. Yeah, there's no chasers here. So. And the reason we do this, guys, is not because I'm a raging alcoholic. It's because it, it loosens the mood. It lubes us up, you know? You need lube. Let's do it, man. Why don't you do your, David has this little, this little toast <laughs> thing. Let's All do right. it. You ready? Yeah. All right. Arriba. Arriba. Abajo. Abajo. Al centro. Al centro. Y adentro. Y adentro. I don't know what you just said, bro. <coughs> oh, my. <coughs> Avion. Ooh, I, if I did not have any hair in my body, I definitely have it now. <sighs> All right, I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. All right, man. So tell me a little bit about yourself. So I like to start. I like to ask the, uh, the question of, all right, here's the situation. You're in an Uber. Uber. Okay. And it's a long drive, long drive. So you, you, he, he asked or she, you know, she's like, Hey, hey you know, what do you do? And I, so, so if you were in an Uber, what, what do you do? Kind of what's your explanation and kind of a long format breakdown. Okay. So growing up, I was always into computers. I built computers in, in high school. And so that led me doing computer science as my college degree. Yeah. And then from there I got a job working as a, a software engineer basically. Right. But I didn't, I didn't love it, man. It was like the cubicle life wasn't something that was making me super happy. And that's when I started thinking about like what else I could do. I started howtobeast.com at the time. I eventually quit the software job after a year, started doing personal training. Then I was like, while I was doing that, I started bouncing around between different like entrepreneurial, like online ventures. That the first way I ever made money online was through publishing or self-publishing Amazon Kindle eBooks. And once I, like experienced, like, you know, like what was the first money you ever made online? Like for yourself? Uh, I did porn for a little bit. Oh, that's right. I <laughs> no, I, to be honest, uh, selling things on eBay when I really wanted to buy cameras for skateboard, skateboarding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and that was like my first experience. And all of a sudden I realized, wow, like I don't need somebody else to pay me. Like yeah. there's actually ways to generate my own money. And that led me down like a, da a deep rabbit hole of, you know, I, I attempted a, a podcast, not on the scale, uh, I attempted a podcast, uh, I, got, I did the blog, and then after a few years of that, I was kind of, you know, I stopped the software job, I stopped purpose personal training, and I was making like enough money to like break even. Luckily yeah. I'd made some savings from the software job, but after like two or three years, I, I like, I was, I was thinking, you know, maybe this like just isn't meant to be, maybe I'll go back to the software world. I applied for a few software jobs, but I was really big into watching YouTube at that time. But I was always kind of like nervous about making YouTube videos because I'd watch, your videos or Christian or Elliot Hulse or some of these other guys. And I was like, well, they're so comfortable on camera. They have like cool production quality. Like that seems really intimidating. So I gave myself a year. This was January, 2017. I bought the Sony RX 100 Mark V camera, right. which I found out about from, from your videos. Funny enough. Influenced. Influenced. Yes. Sony, I didn't give you a cut for that. I'm sure. But, <laughs> uh, and I was like, look, I'm going to give it one year. I'm not going to focus on releasing any like products or monetizing because through the blog, I was monetizing a small audience through releasing like fitness courses or the confidence courses. I was like, I'm just going to see if I release two videos per week, what happens. And I remember it was like in August that year, 
I was in Toronto on a trip with Julia and I was waking up every morning looking at YouTube and I was like, yeah, we got a thousand subscribers yesterday. Yeah, we got another thousand subscribers yesterday. And this is from a lot of these, these early videos I had like approaching girls on the street yeah. in Boston. And at that point I just started investing like more time, more money, like all the money I had at that time into it just to see like, where can this YouTube thing go? Cause I never had anything have that like initial level of success. And then since then it's been two YouTube videos a week, uh, you know, obviously some businesses have been, have been built around the channel, but that is, that's the Uber pitch. Uh, you know, it's crazy. If I was the Uber driver, I'd be like, I didn't ask for your backstory yet, David. I just asked, what do you do? <laughs> well, bro, you know, when someone asks, what I do like, you do? It's a loaded question. I like how instead you, you, you didn't straight go in and be like, I'm a YouTuber. I'm an entrepreneur. You're like, well, <clears throat> my mom met my dad and <laughs> like, uh, that's good, man. Okay. So YouTube is, is what you would say that you, you do. Is that like the first thing? If someone asked me in one word, what do you do? Man, that's tough. What would you say? I mean, just like, what do you identify as, as a, like, how do you make your money? If someone asks you, do, are you? YouTuber slash business owner. Okay. So, but, so YouTube is still something that comes out of your mouth first, which is, that's, that's, that's for me too. No, yes. I, I, I mean, a lot of my time on a weekly basis goes into YouTube and I enjoy that time. We're going to get into that because David is quite obsessed with the tubes. Very much so. So n now that we, we've heard your backstory about how you kind of got into it, uh, how did your content originally start? Because... I want to deep dive into the content that you're currently making or what made you popular on the internet because David is sitting at a pretty a little over a million subscribers, which is not an easy feat. And he's done it in a shorter period of time by far than what I've done. So you accumulated this million subscribers um, for a reason in a short period of time. And before we get to kind of what maybe had that serious uptick, what did you start with on YouTube? Well, uh, so Elliot Hulse was like the, and you remember him from the, I mean, he's still around, I believe, but you remember his video. He was real big. Like, he was one of the most motivational people of the time period when I watched him. Yes. I would, I would get hyped up watching his videos. And it was, you know, if, if anyone's un unfamiliar, Elliot Hulse, big in the fitness industry, would have these really just these standing tripod talks and just- Unedited. It was There'd very- like a, a garbage truck going by or something. It was just, like, oh, it's it was truck. how you became a man. Yeah. And it, it really, it was, it was perfect for the time that it came out. Yeah, no, he, and he had a huge impact on me. Yeah, I remember while I was, while I was doing the split of personal training and working the software job, I'd wake up every morning and watch like a couple of Elliot Hulse videos just to yep. like get me fired up. So my early content was, I think, trying to like emulate him. And looking back, I was only like, I, I, I was like, at first I called it, I was how to beast. And I, for a minute I was like trying to get this fitness and I called it born to bulk for a minute. No, very few people know that, but I changed the name. Born to bulk, never cut. <laughs> never cut, just keep <laughs> bulking. <laughs> um, but at first it was these like talking head, like videos trying to be motivational from like the limited experience I had. But the first videos I did that got any traction were these ones like approaching girls in the streets. And it's funny cause like, it wasn't like I released them and like a bunch of people saw them. It was like, I released them because I was also and we can go into that if you want, but I had like a very not successful adolescence with women. And that was something else I was trying to like build confidence in. So I was doing these videos in Boston where uh, I'd approach girls and I try to get their number. And those like weeks or months after I published them, all of a sudden just started like the algorithm caught them or something. And I think that's what the videos that initially led to the, the growth as opposed to like the talking head videos that, that I was also doing. Did you start these uh, I guess, dating advice, how to pick up women videos. Did you start that because you understood that's what guys wanted? Or did you want to try to build your own confidence in talking to women? So you're like, I'll make a video on talking to women. Cause it seems like a very strange, I'm going to give motivational advice into fitness. And then now I'm going to show picking up girls on the street. Yeah. I would say that it was, it was me trying to document the, 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 the journey that I was on, right? Mm. So that was something that I that was important to me to improve in, and I'd made a lot of improvement at that point versus where I'd come from. So I think part of it was like, I think these are videos that people enjoy watching, because at that time there wasn't too many people actually showing like how it actually happens, right? And actually filming an actual interaction, but it was also something I was working on. So it was also, I think, documenting my growth at the same time. And these were real, so, so you created they were paid actors, paid <laughs> actresses. You never know, man. You, you, everyone starts with YouTube, starts with the prank channels. You turn yeah. out that uh, eventually you need to, it's like, they're not really fake, but it's like I needed to have this sort of stage interaction yep. to get the, the Bro, if you, if you watch those videos, if those were actresses, man, I paid some really bad actresses. Really? Because the earlier ones were like, they're pretty uh, cringy in retrospect. 
And when, when you go, let's say, onto the street, which you do less of these days, right? It's, it's, you don't do those as much. Well, the issue was that the, when you go, it's not just like you're organically approaching a girl. If you're filming a video and you're trying to, in a few hour period, approach three or four girls and you want them to be attractive girls, it's, it's, it's tough to find a place where there's like a super high volume of girls kind of like by themselves walking by. And because of that, a lot of times we'd go to college campuses. And then once I got into my late twenties, it just felt like not, not a, a natural thing to do when you're talking to, you know, 21, 22 year olds. Yeah. And, and I mean, you did them in places. I mean, those types of videos, these picking up girls, that's yeah. something that I personally have never done not only on video, but in real life. I've tried to get Max to make those videos, Absol by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so you, for example, in, in picking up girls would go to college campuses in the middle of the day, in daylight. So if, for me, it's more of like, I want to be out at a bar drinking. We rub elbows, casual high. It starts to come to a conversation. I'm like, yeah. unless that happens, I'm just going to keep talking to my friends. I'm not going to go try to approach women. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if that's like a confidence thing or more of a... I could never do that. So, so what was your, I guess, like confidence level building that up? Were you just always like, it doesn't matter. Like if I make myself a fool, it doesn't matter. Like I'm never going to see this person again. Or how did you build this confidence level to interact with random, you know, uh, I'm assuming attractive girls that you were trying to, whether, whether it be like get their number, get information for the video or, Hey, this also could pan out in real life. I don't know if you're in a relationship at the time, but like, what was your mindset with that? Well, it was a reaction against like years of like intense insecurity with girls where like going through high school, I saw my friends starting to have girlfriends, hook up with girls. And I just like was just too afraid, man, that it was, I was going to get rejected and it wasn't going to work out. So right. I kind of just lived a life of like building computers, playing basketball, hanging out with bros. And like that was that. And I think after I went through college, I felt like, well, I, like maybe I missed my chance because when yeah. you're in college, you're surrounded by, you know, parties, women. Yeah, it's it's like all there and then yeah. when I didn't really towards the end of college I, I I mean to some extent I had like limited success but like when you're surrounded by all that and then all of a sudden you graduate and for a minute I was like okay well I think maybe I missed my shot and I'm just gonna like die, die lonely yeah, <laughs> no. like your, your mind fast forward no I get it so I think I felt like my back was against the wall and I had to like force myself into really uncomfortable situations to get some level of comfort, like just talking to attractive girls. And it's proven because the confidence you have in those videos, I could never do. And I consider myself a very confident man, but I, 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 I have never, and this isn't even an exaggeration, I have never cold approached a girl out in public that wasn't in an inner circle of friends that I knew in my entire life. And so that confidence level is, is, is big. And I think a lot of people who probably enjoyed your content were like me and like, I could never do that. But then they see a guy, maybe they could relate to maybe how you physically looked or your personality. And they're like, that's similar to me. He gives me the confidence to do that. So, so when you started these videos, that is when you immediately started seeing this spike in, in social interact or, you know, social media, right? Yeah. So YouTube. Yeah. Um, so then you kind of leaned into that more. Yeah. And then you, since then, have you Obviously now we're gonna to get to kind of a, you know expanding on YouTube, but for the lo a long period of time, did you solely focus on pickup tactics, m advice for men? Yeah, I'd say like, so 2017 I started, towards the end of that year is when the, the momentum built. And obviously as I saw like these videos doing well, I, I doubled down on them because it made sense if you're trying to throw something and something's working, right? Like that's the type of content to make more of other yeah. than just like the content that's not hitting as hard. So that was definitely like a lot of those were the the videos I focused on up front. Um, but I, inevitably I grew kind of tired of making those videos. They're, they're not super fun to make. Again, you're also like really trying to manufacture these interactions where like, and I didn't have a good cameraman doing it. It was like right. me and my buddy Dave, who was not, and still to this day, he's really not good with the camera. Well, and you got to hide in plain sight type of thing, right? Yeah, and he'd be like, because, and we were not using like a, a long lens. Yeah. It was like a like a 35 millimeter, bro. So you gotta be pretty close Weren't to it. the girl's like, is, is that guy filming us? No, 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 I don't, <laughs> I don't know him. <laughs> I mean, yes, it did happen. He'd be like sitting on a staircase and I'd basically have to approach a girl like exactly in front of the staircase he was sitting on. Right. So yeah, they weren't, they got a little frustrating to make. Okay. Granted, I probably should have just invested in like better camera gear and like actual cameraman who could help me with this, but. Uh, you made it work. No, I made it work and then slowly transitioned to other content, of course. So the, the next content you started making was dating advice and giving men uh, relationship advice, picking up girl advice, uh, right? right? Well, yeah, that, that was about the same time. It's not every single video I released was one of those. So those were like kind of like maybe 25% of the videos were maybe actual like, let's go pick up girls. The other 75% was 
still like a talking and, head video. And why do you think that, why do you think guys need, like wh why was the content you were creating needed in the market? Well, again, I, I don't think a lot of people were, there's, there's no shortage of dating, of right. dating advice videos on YouTube. Uh, I think that the, the, especially in that day and still somewhat ex to this day, I don't want to talk bad on anyone, but I think a lot of dating advice is like an over technical analysis and they try and tie it to like really deep uh, themes of gender differences or like they try and really like analyze all this thing. And I was trying to be more like the bro who's just like, hey, like you just got to like go talk to girls and figure it out. I make it like simple and, and decomplicated and simplify. I think that's that's what made it stand out from the, the other stuff from guys who are a little bit more like trying to be really technical about everything. And when you say technical, are you kind of referring to stuff like red pill, blue pill type of? Yes, and just like earlier uh, dating advice. Can you explain red pill and blue pill? It's, it's a reference to, which I never knew. Yeah, I never made the correlation of it's, it's a reference to the matrix. Like I, I get it, <laughs> but I didn't understand how it was, you know, stay in this reality, take yeah. this pill, you know, experience true life with this pill. Uh, in, in regards to relationships and men's thoughts on approaching women or women in general, can you explain in a kind of a brief yeah, overview of, of what the red pill is? I'll give my explanation. There's a lot of people with very strong Cause, beliefs. Because I feel like people probably don't understand this if they've never heard yeah. of like the red pill, but maybe your explanation uh, is will open people's eyes and be like, oh, that is what I think, or that's opposite of what I think. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Uh, I, I, I want to preface it by saying there's some people with very strong beliefs about what the red right. pill is or what it is. Extremists, so if you will. The <laughs> extremists. There'll be comments that's like, that's not red pill. He's blue pill. Don't listen to him. <laughs> this but, simp. <laughs> I think that the at least the idea is that uh, red pill is more of like a realistic uh, idea of what dating dynamics are. Blue pill would be more what most people grow up hoping for it to be. So what you see more portrayed in Hollywood, that you're going to meet someone, fall in love. It's all going to work out. A woman's going to complete your life. You're going to live happily ever after. Red pill more being that like there's obvious, especially in today's day and age, where between Tinder, Bumble, Instagram, like people know their, you know, quote unquote value on the dating market, uh, you know, women who have a lot of guys interested in them, it's not like pre-social media where maybe they weren't as aware of that. Right. And because of that, uh, you know, you have to approach it from like a more realistic mindset that you're not just gonna like profess your love to someone and it's gonna work out uh, that there's, they have options, you have options and you have to treat it a little bit more like it, it, that mindset. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it does. And, and on the extreme side, do you think a lot of red pill guys who, do you think they, I don't want to say hate women, but they hate, they think there's some, there's this sort of stigma that every girl is out to ruin a guy's life. Yes, no, for sure. But I think it's the same way. The, the analogy I like to use is like, if you're going to, you're someone who has multiple businesses and, and you're someone who invests into to crypto, uh, it, the stock market. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm into losing money. Yes, yeah, <laughs> yes, we all are right now. Um, but you're like, when you, do something, there's a risk that it's not gonna work out, right? And I think that a lot of a lot of people, be, because of like this red pill ideology, they, they, they focus a lot on more like the downside of if you were to go in a monogamous relationship with a girl that she could cheat on you, you could get hurt. Uh, if you were married and you were divorced, she could take half of your assets. And they really focus on, on like the negative side of things and, and, dis, and use red pill as like a, kind of like a, a guise for why like, let's focus on that. And like, like, let's never do that. Like, you know, I'm just going to casually date. I'm never going to do anything else because it's just going to end terribly. And, uh, is that because you think, you think that guys think that girls are only after what I hypergamy, I believe it's called where they're always trying to have, you know, date guys with the, the best social status, the best resources. They're always trying to date up and they kind of hold women to this certain, uh, level of like, I'm not good enough for this person or like uh, kind of like social statuses. Yeah, no, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's, it, it can be, and I can't speak for everyone, but for a lot of guys, it can be rooted in, in deep insecurity that like, I'm comparing myself to other guys. I know that there's other guys out there that are probably are able to attract uh, women better than me, maybe because they have a higher social status, they have more money. And that because of that, if I, if there's a girl I'm with, like, it's never going to be secure because she'd always, she could always like leave me for the next best thing. That's like, I think that's like the food, the, the right. negative red pill. What's, what's your thought? What's your opinion on advice for guys? I guess balancing understanding, yes, there's always that risk of a girl leaving you, a girl cheating on you, it not working out versus I'm never gonna go anything. Because to be honest, 
and until I met my fantastic, wonderful girlfriend that I'm crazy about, I think I had the, the mindset that you explained earlier about the reason that, I, because I take every negative relationship that I've ever been in, and it's almost like every relationship ended, not just a, it was really nice to, a relationship, uh, you know, let's move on. Yeah. It was something bad happened. Yeah. Whether, be, whoever's fault it was. So you started to like precip pre precipitate, precipitate. You started so, to precipitate something was gonna happen each time. Yes, I, I assumed that, I kind of was in the mindset of, every girl is going to break my heart, so there's no point in you know, being with anyone. Any, every girl I talk to is going to be talking to some other girl, a guy behind my back, isn't, is gonna be texting someone because that's all that I associated every girl that I had been with yep. up to that point. And I thought, what's like, every, you know, if, if I stay with a girl for a long period of time, if things go great, if we get married, it's going to end in a divorce. She's going to ruin my life. She's going to take half of my money. Yeah. And, and I, I guess I always had that outlook yeah. on life or on, on girls, on relationships. Yeah. I was like, it's just, there's no point. There's no point. Every, every girl's out to get me. Well, I think more and more and more and more guys every year have that outlook because of, I mean, it's something that happens and people experience it. And like you, you think it's going to happen again, but also like red pill content has gotten super popular. Yeah. So I think it's also that's also being preached on guys. So that's how it's going to end. So people with my mindset, and I guess what, what happened for me is that, I don't know, it, it's one of those things that it just, everything in my life shifted is w when I met the person that changed my perspective. Yep. Uh, and so what is your, I guess, advice to guys, maybe before they meet that person yep. of slowly shifting your advice, I guess of like, hey, you know, if you're successful in life, everyone talks about, you know, hey, not like the disregard women acquire wealth type of mindset, but hey, don't necessarily worry about trying to find a partner. Focus on yourself as a man. Focus on building your body, your mind, your wealth, and you know when the right time comes, it'll all kind of like fall into place. Whereas I think people look at that same mindset and think of the uh, the headspace of, okay, but when I get to that point and then I meet a girl it's only because I'm successful is the reason that she's with me or she would have never talked to me if I wasn't successful, which means she's only into me for my success. Well, I think the problem with both of those things is like, they're very much like a, like a dating centric mindset. They're like, I'm just leveling myself up because that's going to get me better women. And then like, well now because I've leveled up, like I, women are just going to take advantage of me where I think it's, it's probably healthier to like, work on yourself and whether that's your money your body like for yourself because that lives a more fulfilling life and then to, to i mean I, I always advise people to casually date just because like in the current market i think if you go into uh, uh the first few dates if you go in with like this idea that like this could be my girlfriend this could be awesome this is this is what i want to get into this that that you you start in your mind to set expectations that the other person doesn't have any reason to reciprocate other than these like maybe you feel like well i thought she was gonna be my next girlfriend and then she flaked on me after the third date and then you feel like maybe you butthurt about it but it's like why did you have those expectations again the the, the good part of the red pill or i think <clears throat> excuse me the accurate part is that like it is kind of a marketplace now just because of dating apps and instagram people are aware of their options so i think what i think is the the more healthy mindset is that like it makes sense to focus on improving yourself also because it lives to leads to a more fulfilling life right and then it will unlock like more attractive girls who, who are interested in you. And you can be bitter about that if you want, but it's also, I think just like a reality. And if you casually date girls and that doesn't mean to like look at them as less than you, right? They're not, but just to like enjoy like casual dates with girls until you meet someone who after it's, Oh, Hey, it's been three dates. It's been four dates, it's been five dates. Not only am I still excited to see her, but she's still excited to see me. Oh, now it's been, you know, a month, two months. And then at that point, rather than like expecting each girl to be your girlfriend, let it like prove you like, oh man, maybe this girl, maybe there is something here. Right. It, it's tough to do that because we naturally get excited when we meet like a cool girl. You know? yeah. And, yeah, and and what you said earlier, and you said this in a recent YouTube video, um, because uh, you give amazing dating relationship advice in all your content. And Thank it's you. wild, before I even started dating my girlfriend, I really like, I, not like I really need this advice, but when you talked about it, it really resonated with me. And something you even recently said about, you know, whenever you see a girl on a, 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 a dating app and she's like, hey, let's let's go out and get a drink, you immediately start maybe romanticizing or fantasizing, 
fantasizing is kind of a stretch, but you start being like, this could be my girlfriend. Oh my gosh. Like what does my last name sound like with her? And you start getting this thing. And I actually would, that's why I had like the problem with kind of relationships because I would have this double mindset where when I would go on a date with a girl, that's what I would think. I'm like, wow, this is going great. Oh my gosh. Like what if she turns to my girlfriend? Oh my, whether it be, wow, she's so attractive. We get along Wow, my friends are going to love her. Everyone's going to, you know, think this about, about me. She's so great. What is my mom going to think? And then like, I not in like a desperate, pathetic way, kind of, I don't know, uh, <laughs> but of just like, I would immediately plan out the best things ever that could happen in my head. But then I'd get to the end of that, that thought and I'd go, and then at the end of the story, that just means my mom, she's going to try to hook up with my best friend and ruin my entire life. You know, so <laughs> I might as well, there's this no point. This I shouldn't a, even go out on a date with her. It was more of, I would go on dates, but after yeah. the first or second, it, it's, it's one of those interesting things. I think a lot of guys go on dates yeah. and they continue to go on dates with someone just to see, hey, is there that connection? Yep. Whereas me, if I haven't found that connection on the first or second date, I'm not gonna, it's kinda like when you watch a, a new show and someone says, no, you gotta get through the first four episodes. That's, it that, starts getting great. That's true a lot though. But see, in my opinion, I, I don't want, I don't wanna almost waste my time to go on three dates to then see if I like the person. For me, and this is how it was with my girlfriend, yep. is the the first interaction with her, Yep. it was almost, this is the one, like, this is the girl. Like, yep. And, and I, it's hard to even explain that. And I have been in the mindset of this anti girl, every girl's out to get me ruin my life, whether it was before I had success or during I have success. And to be honest, you opened my eyes a lot on mindset. And what's interesting is you've been in a committed, happy relationship for how long? Almost six. Well, yeah, we've known each other almost six years. The relationship, I guess, a little over five years. And have you been in the relationship as long as you've started making YouTube videos? Well, the funny thing is, no, but, well, yes and no. I say yes and no because I say 2017 is where I always say that was the official start of YouTube because that's right. when I bought that camera and committed to two videos a week. There was a couple of like, uploads before that, but when I bought that camera, the funny thing is I was already hanging out very casually at that time with Julia. But I remember I spent a thousand dollars on that camera. And for me, that was a huge investment at the time. Right. And afterwards, I remember I went over to, to her place. She lived in the same neighborhood as me back in Boston. I was like, I just bought this camera. I don't know if this might be a waste of money. Uh, so to answer your question, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so what's very interesting is throughout your entire career, you built your career and a million subscribers and really a, a, a big part of your income nowadays with businesses we'll get into later yep. on dating advice, helping men find women, not, and, and what's different about you that I've always appreciated is that your advice is so relatable and real. Whereas you look at a lot of these, I'll use the word extremists, right? These yep. extreme red pill, um, whatever you want to call them. Um, not any, any people by name, but they're just, I guess you have a different mindset than them. They're very just hook. Here's how to hook up with a lot of women, disregard them, only build your wealth, you know, whatever. And your mindset is you can, here's all the tips and advice, but it's fine to find that love and find that relationship. And as you built this audience, you were in a committed relationship, which is very interesting because most people who would give advice on relationships or how to pick up women, are single guys and you're doing it as someone in a committed relationship. So I guess, why did you continue to give that advice of here to pick up women, even though you're no longer picking up women? Well, because it, it played a, that was like me being so unhappy with my dating life. And, and I was like, bro, I, was, I remember going home from like my first job, like laying on the floor of my apartment being like, it would be so amazing to have a girlfriend I could come home to and just hang out with. Like, it was like, it was something that I just felt like I like I, the boat had passed on me. I'd seen all my friends have success with it. And it's like my life was miserable. I had other things going, but like that was like a constant source of like emotional pain. And me finally addressing that in my life, it gave that's what gave me the confidence to, because I was like once I kind of forced myself to start talking to girls and then little by little, I was like, oh wow, I'm able to get like girls' numbers who I don't know, and I'm able to go on a date with them and another date. And and, and you know, before I met Julia, there's several other relationships that I had me confronting that fear and realizing like, wow, I actually am capable of like having healthy relationships with women that proved to me that like, well, there must be other things that like I'm capable of. Like I always liked the idea of being entrepreneurial and starting a business, but that wasn't something that like I had the confidence to do until I right. first tackled my dating life. So because it had such a big impact where like for me making that change or overcoming that fear 
unlocked like my potential in my head, I know there's a lot of other guys out there who that's like a huge pain point. And until they overcome that, likely they'll be limiting themselves in other areas of their life. So even me having a girlfriend and like having figured that out, I feel like that's, that is one way that I can, I hate to say give back. It sounds kind of like yeah. cheesy, but you know what I mean? Like I can give something that other guys can take and be like, oh, maybe this is something I can change also. That's, that's, that's amazing, man. And, and that's what I, I respect so much about you is because you are in an extremely committed relationship, but you still give advice that anyone that unless they're just so ingrained in their extreme ways, like it's anyone who's maybe a single guy could listen to your videos and listen to the way that you um, just give your, your specific mindset on things. And it's very easy to digest and it's relatable. But this is something that that I've always admired about your content is that typically when you have someone, like sometimes you'll talk about your business and you yeah. give some business advice. Same way sometimes I'll whatever talk about girls and, and give dating advice. A lot of people, and this is not everyone, but there's a lot of really great content creators out there, but I think a lot of people get really tied up in their ego and their self image and that they really wanna portray this, this super successful image. And then I think that's a lot of times when people start giving more extreme advice or like almost talking down to their audience. Right. And then, or they want to like really look at themselves as like an expert. And uh, something I always admired about you is that when you're talking about these things, like, I don't know, I'm like, I'm still figuring this shit out. Like, I don't really know what I'm doing. This is yeah. what I'm trying next. Yeah. And I, I, I also try and do my best to like, to, to speak in that way because the other, the other content, I don't know. I don't, to me, that was never as impactful as as people who who kind of just spoke from their experience and like spoke like level with other people they're talking to. Right. Like, I don't even know that made sense. No, I know it, it did and did it and uh, yeah. It just I I think that you're a different breed in the relationship giving advice and you've taken that and you've turned it into a successful career that is not solely based on your advice because you have a lot of other businesses but your number one priority at the moment is YouTube. You hold that to your top tier, right? Yes, yes. It's it's start with the business. I, I still say it's the number one priority though, yeah. Right, and, and I wanna dive into that, but before we do, ladies and gentlemen, it is the time of the, uh, the episode where we have a little game show. Can I add something to the game show? Okay, what is that? Whoa, <laughs> what is this? What was this? These are margaritas. Oh, I got straws. Oh man. This is great. I you know I thought about getting a margarita machine in here. Okay. Yeah. This, well, no machine, but we still got margaritas. Hopefully, this is they're nice. still frozen. No, this is great. Yeah, cheers. Oh. oh, that's all right. Cheers. This is this what the people who are <laughs> listening need to be watching because they're missing out on this. Yeah, the shot. Now you guys got to go get a margarita. Who? Well, this doesn't change anything, David. We still have to do the game show, ladies and gentlemen. And the point of this, I've had some comments saying, "Oh, this breaks it up. There's no point to it. Look, it's just for funsies. It's to split it up." We kind of shift into a new topic afterwards. And I like to get my guests, uh, you know, a little little saucy if we can. But I could get the ones be saucy if you get these questions right. David, <clears throat> yep. we have two trivia questions. All right. Each one will be worth half a shot, potentially up to one full shot you'll need to take. Okay. Are you ready? I'm ready. David, how many amendments are in the Bill of Rights? And these have gotten harder since the Guzman episode. No, I, when I Google these, David, I ask general knowledge questions that most people should know. Amendments in the Bill of Rights. Correct. I'm gonna go ahead and say 10. David, congratulations, you are correct. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Did you do that? Was that just a guess? Man, I don't know. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, I knew one of them was 10. Oh, man. Yeah. I've, this is every episode, it has backfired on me because I'm the one that ends <laughs> up drinking. This is so bad. Okay. I got to. <laughs> please don't get this next one right. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> David. Yep. What is the largest ocean in the world? <laughs> yeah. Compared to what? <laughs> I was waiting for you to finish. It sounded like the mid, mid sentence. You have five seconds, David. Four. The Pacific Ocean. David, I hate my life because <laughs> you got that right. I'm. Not, I think. Okay, this is actually the last time we're doing this. Uh, I can take a shot with you. You're gonna unless do, that goes against the rules. I can take a shot with you. You're gonna do a pity shot for me. Yeah. Okay, actually, there's a there's a bonus one that we did with Heidi that I want to see if, if you can do. Okay. Okay, this is a bonus. And if you get this right, you don't have to take the second shot. I'll, I'll actually do two. 
Okay. This is going to be crazy. It's going to be a tough yeah, one. It's, yeah, it's the, it's the bonus round. I'm going to give you the situation, okay? Okay. You are a cow. You tried to escape the farm. You've jumped over the fence of barbed wire. Unfortunately, you're kind of fat, and your leg got stuck in the barbed wire. Now, help is on the way, but you're hurt. Okay, it's going to be about 45 seconds before someone comes help you. You're going to be fine, okay? What sound would you make as a cow with your legs stuck in barbed wire? I need a full a full attempt at this. Does it have to be an actual sound that cows make? David, please make the sound. Come help me get out these barbed wire. David, that was the worst sound I've ever heard. You lose, you take a shot. That's not a trivia question. There we go. Uh, El Centro something. El Centro something. Whoa. There you go. Ah. That was worse than the first one. <laughs> I need you guys to leave down in the comments uh, if uh, Chaser this time. If you like it. Do you like the game show? Does it split it up? I, th- I think it's nice, dude. I like it. I liked it. I liked it the last episode. I need to do them sooner because I don't, I don't want to just get saucy and then it ends <laughs> in 10 minutes later. Okay, so your content started to evolve mm-hmm. and shift into, you started incorporating your life. Why did you, why did you start incorporating your life? Why did you decide that people are... They don't just need tips. They need to know about what shampoo I use. Yes, I would say that I I'm someone who I think has a degree of creativity inside of me. Like I remember like school projects in uh, middle school, high school, me and my buddies. If we could, there's like several like funny videos we made for the project. We made like a fake like movie that was like funny. And at some point standing in front of a camera and talking seemed kind of boring like on my end at the same time i was watching people like you and christian at the time and you guys making revolutionary content revolutionary content you you took your life and you made it look cool even though you weren't maybe doing the absolute coolest <laughs> thing max you were doing the lamest <laughs> shit i've ever seen in my life well i remember like i i think i've told you this before but i remember one time i was watching one of your videos and a buddy of mine was visiting in town and i was like you gotta watch this video these videos are so good and like four minutes in, he was like, why in the hell do you watch this guy's video? This, this is, is boring. <laughs> that's what I tell anyone. I'm like, unless you're, if anyone clicked on my videos or any of our videos really on a vlog yeah. and just like tried to get into our content, yeah. they'd be like, what is happening? Why is this person <laughs> acting the way that they are? How does this have any views? Who I don't watches this? Waste their time. This guy's embarrassing. Uh, yeah, so there's some inspiration from there um, and also some boredom on my part and some like want to, to to more creatively express myself. My fear was always that if I stopped just making like tip videos that just my audience would evaporate because, they, right, because yeah. they'd think like, why would I watch this guy? And so, so you started and did you want to build kind of like a, you wanted to let people more into your life. So they started coming to your content for David, how to beast, not just David, give me the tips on, on how to pick up chicks or I don't want to watch your videos. Yeah, obviously from like, uh, the, the hope is that, because that becomes more sustainable instantly, as, as you know. Um, so th- there was also a hope for that, right? That it would take some ease off of needing three more tips and three more tips. And at first I actually did like a hybrid, which I, I think this is actually when my content, may, maybe like phase one would have been like approaching girls and just straight up talking videos. I would say like phase two was my like hedge, uh, my hedge on that bet that's, I started doing videos where I, and I still do these types of videos where I gave tips, but it like, it, it, it played itself out over a day in my life. And that for me was like, like the hybrid phase. I don't think there was anyone else doing that at the time. Uh, and at first I got a lot of comments. They're like, bro, just give us the tips. Like what? Well, I don't need to see you like go work out right. before you give me the next tip. But like the audience definitely grew and I definitely started getting a lot more comments. So there was definitely like more engagement because of that. And that was like a stepping stone to doing some just like, you know, pure vlogs. As well, and so one thing about David that I want to say is that, you know, you you remind me a lot of me because I have never seen anyone, and this goes really across most of my friends, that you film and edit your videos, mm-hmm. and your content is extremely high production value. Yeah, I've never seen anyone give the attention to detail in their content as the way that you do. And I would even say sometimes you go above and beyond in terms of an obsessive kind of manner. Mm -hmm. So David, whenever we're hanging out, um, if he's filming a video, it's not like, if, if, if the day is shifting differently than the plan you had in mind, 
David is someone that's like, it, no, 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 this is, we're still <laughs> filming this clip, this can't happen. I need, I need to, everyone need to stop this transition of what we're about to do because I need to film this clip and where you don't really deviate from your, your plan. And so, so your content, um, I guess, how did you get so in, involved in wanting to create this super high production value versus seeing people who just put out their daily life? Like, why do you feel like you need to add in all this kind of fluff, we'll call it, in terms of drone, high production value, themes, transitions? Why, why do you think that? That's a, that's a good question. I don't know if I have a great answer. I feel like maybe part of it if now that I'm like reflecting back as you're asking it, part of it may be like that I think it's part of like my identity mm -hmm. and that like the content needs that. Part of it is that I do enjoy it and I really like, I make videos that, that I mean, yes, a lot of them that I think would maybe tell like valuable lessons for my life. Um, but beyond that, I like to make videos that I would like enjoy watching and find entertaining. Right. And you know this as well as probably anybody maybe better than anyone else on YouTube that there's like some like pacing required. I know me and you've talked about this a lot. There's like a, yeah. a two to three minute rule where there's gotta be like some type of, it maybe doesn't have to be like a crazy edit, but there's gotta be some type of transition after two or three minutes or people are just like, their brains are gonna explode. And they're not gonna be able to keep and watching. What's crazy is we just assume that. <laughs> we, we just assume. You confirmed, we confirmed it for each other. <laughs> yeah, that, that people are going to get bored after a certain amount of time. Yeah. I need to change the, you know, the, it needs to have a, a transition shot. It needs to switch the environment. I need to, cut here and then turn over here and continue my conversation, even though it's the exact same conversation, but I'm facing to the left rather than straight. And I think we think that people really want this type of content and engaging content when maybe they don't, right? <laughs> the, I mean, like the, the, the channels that get the highest views for the most part, don't do that. Right, but it, it shows your your attention to detail and yep. your, your ability to create amazing content. And I know, you know, you're someone like myself and you always wanna push yourself and we always say, I want my last upload to be better than our, our best, or my, my, I want my last upload to be the best one, right? On, like yeah. my new one's gonna Each be better one's, than the last one. Yeah, exactly. Right, I don't know what I was trying to say. This shot's really <laughs> kicking in, you know what I'm saying? But at a certain point, you hit this kind of top tier where you're like, I cannot produce any higher of quality. Unless you're to go like Sam Colder and have like eight videographers following you around. Correct, when yeah. you are self-filming, self-editing, there's only a limit to how high of a production value can be. And that's not even taking into account now that we have significant other responsibilities with the, the businesses that we're doing. Right, and and so David, like myself, you have been consistently uploading content for many, many years. And as, and we have a lot more going on than just YouTube, but we still put YouTube as such a high priority, right? Yeah. And as you've made your life more stressful and busier, you've continued to make sure that YouTube fits into that. And, and, and why do you still hold YouTube to this top tier, top tier kind of like status that it takes precedent over every single other thing. And it's so important that I, like I cannot keep, it's like this, this beast that you have to keep feeding and you can never stop and because, and you don't know what will happen if you stop. So you just got to keep feeding it. Yeah. I, I think part of it's an identity of being a YouTuber as well as a business owner, right? And not wanting to let go of that. I mean, I think part of it, I, I genuinely do. I still get excited for filming days. So I think I, I, I there, like I still do enjoy it. Yeah. That being said, obviously there's some weeks where there's a lot of other like responsibilities and I still have to like struggle to make YouTube a, a priority. So I think that there's different things. So I enjoy it. I have like an identity that I'm definitely nowhere close to like, I'm not like, that's not gonna be next week I stop making YouTube videos. I'm no, nowhere near letting, right. being ready to let go of that. And there's also like a fear that if YouTube stops that, the, the businesses will slowly decline as that was at least the initial marketing machine of each of the businesses, which I know is a similar case to yourself. That, that is how I feel. And, yeah. and one thing, another relatable trait that I feel like we have besides our passion for YouTube, our passion for, and, and when I say passion for creating high quality content, David is someone that I go through phases where I'm gonna film this super casual vlog today. It's gonna be, in my opinion, I lazy. Can't, I can't do it. Yeah, I yeah, can't I do know. it. <laughs> David, I don't think there's gonna be a video that doesn't have a third person shot with some music to your car, to the drone, to a theme. And I think I, I, it's really fucking annoying sometimes because you're so dedicated to it. But on the other side of my brain, I respect it so much because I understand your mindset on it. 
and I understand how much you care about it. And it's almost, you know, it, it probably affects your, your mental space because of how much you care about it and how fluctuation there is in the market of views on yep. YouTube. And like, I would even say, I've never been someone that has admitted to, I get, depre I get depressed, I get anxiety. But I think if I was, because I'm like, I don't know what that feels like. I don't know what th trigger is like, oh, that's depression. Oh, that's, you know, anxiety. You don't want to label it. Correct. Okay. And I feel like YouTube and the, I guess the constant, I need to raise the bar. I need to produce this content that's better than I've ever made in my entire life. Um, but the metrics that come along with it, the analytics of views, the analytics of likes, the analytics of that stuff, yep. um, I think affects our mental space. How, how, do you, how do you feel in terms of, would you feel that you get depressed from just the way that a video will perform? Yeah, so first of all, I think I have to apologize to you for introducing you to the uh, the YouTube studio app. Correct, yeah, which for, for you guys watching is, uh, it's just the analytics, but it will show you when you publish a video versus your last 10 uploads. You know, is it in first place, is it in fifth place, is it in last place? And we call that a 10 out of 10 when it's in last place. And me and Max text about this every, every yep. day our videos go live. And I'm trying, normally a 10 out of 10, if you see a 10 out of 10 of the opposite sex, that's a that's the, the hottest person in the world. 10 YouTube's, out of 10, YouTube. Yeah. You get a 10 out of 10 on your video. You just want to go to sleep. You're like, I hate everything <laughs> the day. And it truly ch ch you know, ch affects your mood. I think I, yes. What, was, someone, what was the question? <laughs> it, it's someone, uh, do, you, do you feel like, Mm. depression is is a part of YouTube. It, it's this it's this business that you keep putting in the same amount of work each day, if yep. not more, but the return on your on your output fluctuates. Yeah, how no, does that make you feel? No, it's very challenging. And I know this is one thing me and you bond on often is that we've we've ridden this wave of YouTube and we've seen our our views and our audience build over time. And I don't I just still don't know what it was, but something around like eight to 10 months ago, I feel like something changed on YouTube. And I don't know if like the, the day in the lifestyle of content just isn't like on trend as much as it was. And people are more on like the TikTokified like type the of challenges. Like, yes. Like quick cuts, like really like, uh, holds your attention to like a, another level. Like you're watching Instagram reels, like that's made its way into YouTube. Um, but obviously the, we haven't had just like continuous upward growth. And yes, it, I think that it does lead on on some days, especially like when it's first started happening, maybe like eight to 10 months right. ago that we just didn't have this continuous upward trend. Some, yeah, when you see that 10 out of 10, man, some days is like, especially when you, because a lot of times it feels like it's the video that you felt was like such a good video. It's, it's like the video you took an extra two hours to edit. You, mm -hmm. you put a little bit of extra effort into that edit. You felt like the storyline was really good. And that, it just seems like YouTube just knows that. And it's like, you know what? Fuck you, this one's gonna be the 10 out yeah. of 10. We're and, not. And, and someone like you is yeah. your production value never slips. Yep. The, your product, every video that David uploads uh, is the same high production quality as any other video. So when one doesn't perform, but you're putting in the same effort, yep. you're just like, no one cares. Yep. I'm done. I'm irrelevant. I'm dying. Yeah, it's, I'm, like, I'm it's like we talked with dating that like uh, one girl rejects mm -hmm. you and your mind immediately goes to like, I'm going to die single. The same thing happens on YouTube where one video does like really poor and you're seeing it's like, wow, this is like 20,000 less views than another right. video would have at this time. And your mind immediately goes to like two months are going to pass. No one's going to be watching my videos. My businesses are going to fail. I'm going to go broke. And, and that's going to be that. Like your, I, your mind goes down that path. I think the biggest thing and, and, and the, the reason, path. yeah. And the reason I brought this up is because I wanted to kind of tie it into um, business success yep. because as our channels fluctuate, I think the biggest thing that first comes into my, my mind, which I'm assuming is yours, is that because I'm getting less views, because I'm getting less engagement, it is directly going to affect my business and that is going to start going down, yep. right? That's probably the first thing that comes into your head. It's not- Well, it's the, not just tied the, to only the vanity metrics. Correct, that. It correct. It feels like it's tied to it, our well-being, our, our security in life. Correct. And, yes. and, but let me ask you, as you, as we've seen this fluctuation in views, would you say that your other businesses have had a slightly downward trend or would you say that your businesses are continuing to do well, if not continuing to improve year after year, even if your social media presence does not imp directly have that same trajectory? Yes, no, no, for sure. The, the businesses have, and we talk about it, right? The businesses continue to grow. 
they they continue to increase over time but still i can't quite unlink this this like this the Im- bi- it's this importance of YouTube. it's interesting because financially you would think that and i think what happens is a lot of people nowadays start social media for financial gain yeah. that's like their number one like i see people making a lot of money i want to make a lot of money whether they it's have a, a personality or not world. when we got started that was not you didn't look at people with big youtube channels as wealthy like, like that's not yeah. what you didn't see it wasn't glamorized people with big social media for the most part weren't wealthy they yeah. just had like a big social media following and it's i think it's maybe that's part of the disconnect is that now it's changed and people who have big social media understand for the most part how to monetize it and now there's like a glamour that comes with having a big following and a wealth that, that wasn't when we got started right and so as as your youtube maybe i'll even say mine it's it's declining it's it's, it's <laughs> it, there's no other way to put it right you have to yep. you have to accept it it's yep. it's, it's not increasing no nope. Every now and then we have some that that do almost as good as what we once did, but we're not increasing. (laughs) You have to admit it. But the businesses are flourishing. The businesses are growing, right? And what I think we've both done that is so impressive is that we've almost uh, become, I like to call it the anti-influencer. Yep. Because a lot of people now start social media and they start tying themselves to brands and they become, their identity is their commission on how much they can sell of this brand. They look at themselves like, this is me, and these are, and like right under their name and their uh, their profile, these are my two sponsors. Yeah, these are all that. Yeah. And, and you're someone who's very unique because you're like myself, is you have a lot of businesses that are doing extremely well, and you were in the beginning uh, with, whether it be clothing companies, supplement companies, but just like myself for some of the, like for clothing, for example, why do you feel you you decided to go the route of I'm going to stop being the guy that's a team member on this company and I'm going to own my own company. I'm going to because a lot of people never take that leap because I'll tell you guys, it's a lot simpler, less stressful, easier to just get a commission and a and a retainer or a salary from a company. You don't have to put any money up. Right. Yep. You're like, why would I why would I cut this back and take on the stress of that? And why do you feel like you're the type of person that wanted wanted to take on the stress level of you were with Alphalete, yep. right? One of the largest uh, fitness apparel brands in the game. Yep. You see people making this crazy money and, and commissions. You see what they've built. Yep. And you decided to leave that company to focus 100% on your on your, your own brand. And, and why is that? Uh, I think it comes down to, when we look to create a YouTube video, we don't just look, how am I gonna like quickly create a video that can get views, right? Like I, I look at each video as its its own separate being and entity and and thank you for, I, you know, I, I think we have a big mutual respect because of that, right? Yeah. And I think it's a similar thing with with clothing where, or let's talk with Alphalete. And mm-hmm. I loved working with Alphalete. I, that's, that's a brand that I always admired and when I finally started working with them, it was, it was amazing. Um, but it doesn't fulfill that same, that same need of like, I'm creating something that's my own from like envisioning it to seeing it now be a physical thing in front of me to now seeing other people see the value in it enough to like actually put up their own right. money to, to, to get it. And then they're wearing it and they're happy with it. And there's something like really special about that process. I think even if in the, in the short term you end up like, I'm getting ready to launch the supplement brand, hopefully this month, maybe next month. You're, on, you're, you're starting a supplement brand, but you are with transparent labs huge company. Yes. And now you're leaving being an athlete to start your own company. Yes. And that's, that's, I mean, I haven't been promoting them for the last year. So essentially for the last year I gave up the, the, I mean, as far as like working for another brand goes, I was making very good monthly revenue from them. Not even revenue, right? It's a straight profit if you're an influencer. Uh, but there's, I don't know, man, there's some itch, there's some itch that like, that needs to be scratched. Do you I feel, feel like, like you're, you're playing the long-term game rather than the short-term financial success? Yeah, I feel like it's, there's, there's a few factors. One factor is that uh, there's things I saw that I wanted to do differently with my own supplement brand and that you can't do that unless it's your own brand. Right. There's the other, there's the other factor that it's very satisfying at least for me to, to to bring something to create something of my own, and there's of course the other factor that when you create something of your own, it's in the sh- in the short term. You ta- I say this: you got to take a short term L to get like a long term W. Right. You have to give up money. Not just have to give up making money. You have to literally lose money 
Like just like you're spending money that you're just hoping, you know, six months, one year down the line comes back uh, to, to make to increase your prayer, your profits over time. So yeah. I think it's, it's, a, it's a combination of different factors. And and what's interesting is when you left Outfleet, so you had started your clothing company, which is called Edge. Yep. Right. Uh, amazing stuff. Makes things in the similar space, uh, fitness apparel, joggers, T-shirts, lifestyle kind of stuff. Now you had Edge and you created Edge while you're working with Outfleet. Yes. I, I Yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So... And this is similar to myself, who I, I had. Ape Athletics. I have, I have Everford Apparel, but I was still with Ape Athletics. Yep. And what I think is something that kind of went off in your brain is you could you could promote both. And I'm sure maybe maybe in the back of your head or in a lot of people would maybe ask the question of like, why are you with a clothing company if you have your own clothing company? And in my opinion, I think what you probably thought was while I'm making good money with this other clothing company, I can promote both. Yep. And I think at a certain point, you have to decide, I want to, I want to go all in on myself yep. rather than just promoting another clothing company. Not, not that there's anything wrong with it, yeah. but you were like, I, I, I guess it's, it's it, like, it doesn't uh, make sense, right? Well, it's like a girl who's in a relationship that she knows, or you could say a guy, I don't mean to, yeah. you, there's someone who's in a relationship with someone, but they know like, long term, I'm probably not gonna be in a relationship with someone. And they start like, and this is not a healthy thing, but you start like planting seeds right. to see like what else is going to, what you're going to hop to next. But, you, but yes, yes. In the short term, you're, you're afraid to let go of that like steady paycheck you're getting from the other company. You also, I think also part of it's like a realistic approach to like, I don't know how to make clothing, bro. Like at first, I didn't know what I was doing. How long, how long were you with, how long were you with Alphalete while you had Edge? I want to say a year. Granted over that year, it's not like we were doing launches every other month. So, so a, is, a year, so you were with Alphalete for a year. Uh, that's that's like from from my best recollection. But again, over that time, there was probably two edge launches the first year. So right. I think it was w once I got to the point where I was like, once it happened once actually, where there was an Alpha Elite launch and an edge launch, and I was like, I have to promote edge. I can't promote Alpha Elite. Once it got to that point, I I mean, I've spoken to Christian before I even started Edge just right. to like make sure he was cool with me doing both at the same time. But once it got to that part, uh, we, we talked again. And it became more like a. Hey, you know, bro, if you could, if, if the launches don't coincide at the same time, I'll give out a little shout out. If it does, no big deal. So once it became like a clear conflict of interest, I think is when, is when I decided to move on, but it's tough because, because there's some clout that comes for working right. with like a, a well-known brand and there's money. Right. hundred percent. And do you think that any part of you, when you had edge working with Alphalete in the back of your mind, you're like, obviously I'm proud of my brand. I want to build my brand, but the reason that I'm not leaving Alphalete is because it's such a big brand. Like, why would I leave it? Like edge can never be what this is. Yep. And you're like, I, I, I really want that income. Like I, I know I can do well with my clothing, but I don't, yeah. you know, it's not going to be like that. So why would I, why would I give up this other income? Yep. And, and, and there was a point where you shifted and you're like, I'm going to go in on myself. Yep. And I think that's what stands you apart from a lot of other influencers. You can't make that leap. You're saying you can't make that leap. A lot of people in the influencer space will always be the people that are building their audience to build other someone else's brand to build someone else's brand. And a lot of people will get these fat paychecks and yeah. keep in mind, influencers nowadays are making a whole lot more than when I started. No, yeah, no Pe people I, a year or two in are making light years more. I mean, there's, there's well, people do you think you would have started your own businesses if you were making the type of money these guys and, are making. And today? that's what's interesting. And that's what, I, what, I think is the short-term game versus the long-term game because yeah. if you are making, a lot of these younger influencers are make, like actually making, I don't know if people know this. Up, off, to, up to 50K a month or something 50, for one sponsor. 50 to 70K yeah. a month from one from sponsor. A clothing supplement or clothing sponsor, a supplement yeah. sponsor. So it's like, they're like, why would I leave that? I don't know. Would you have been able to, if you were making 50K a month from Ape Athletics, would you have been able to leave? And you know what? I there was points when I was making more with Ape Athletics than I was with Ever Forward per month. Yep. And there was a point when I said, I want I want to be my own person. Nothing to disrespect the company, nothing to disrespect anyone else, but I want to be my own person. Yep. And something that I think you have done amazingly is stood apart from a lot of these other influencers and you are your own entity. You're in your own realm. You're not in this niche of group of YouTubers where there's a couple of these guys and you're one of those guys, you're in your own space. 
you're a business owner and you're absolutely crushing it, right? And I think that's what's different than a lot of people who are playing kind of a short term, short term financial gain, right? Because I'll tell you, you know what's cooler than making 70K a month from a sponsor is making a million dollars a month from your own business. It's, right? It's, you gotta have, like, you gotta, you have to have, because that's a question I, and I'm sure you get this all the time too, is like, I wanna start my clothing brand, like, or I wanna start my supplement brand, or I wanna, whatever it is. I know you, you probably get that about candy now too, but it's, you really have to have a long term outlook because there's gonna be years where you're stagnating or you're not, where you're, there's so much to figure out, right? There's going to be years where, before you get to that point. Right. And why do you believe in yourself so much? Well, why not take the easy route of, I could work with a, my, my following is so big. I bet I could be like, you know, Hey guys, I tried the clothing thing. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to go work with this, this clothing company. I'm going to start making the same profit every single month. Why yeah. do you believe in yourself so much that you've transitioned into owning everything yourself and being, I guess the word, like your own man, like your own man in the influencer space, that now you're truly a business owner that has a YouTube channel, not a YouTuber that has some businesses. That, that's a good question, man. I, th I mean, I think that belief was built little by little. Yeah. You know, I think that it, maybe it started with overcoming the, the, the stuff with women. And that's like the, the initial belief that like, wow, this is something I didn't think was possible. Now this is possible. Wow. I never thought I could have 50k subscribers on YouTube now wait, 100k whatever you know now I have that okay well now I'm you know representing different brands what if I started my own brand right oh wow we sold out all those clothes that we bought so I don't think it's you know you don't, you don't just walk into putting down whatever 200k onto like investment into inventory for a clothing launch hoping you sell it I think I think it was like a it was a staircase I don't think that it happened overnight and I think also I've had you know, mentors and other people that I've seen um, in this community here in Houston and other places that are that are always one step ahead of you, and and that opens your eyes to like what's possible, right? Like, yeah, you can see what other people are doing, and and if someone else can do it, like why why can't you? Do you take pride in kind of owning all the businesses yourself rather than um, kind of like because it's very easy to look at everyone around you and understand, to be honest, yeah. like I, I think, I don't think I've ever said this on maybe social media, but I'm probably the least financially successful person in my circle. And I think that really puts it into perspective because people look at maybe myself and think that I'm crushing it and I do, but I, I'm, I'm always comparing myself to everyone else. And the people in my close circle are making me look like shit in terms of success. And it's very easy to compare yourself to everyone around you. Yep. I mean, you start with, I put so much work in my YouTube videos. Yep. You look at someone else who clearly is not putting the same effort as you. Yep. You're like, that person literally doesn't care yep. about the content they're putting out and their views are higher. Mm -hmm. And it's a pride thing. Yep. How, do you, how do you feel being surrounded, you always want to be in that circle of people that are, you know, you, you, you're the sum of the five people that are around yeah, and yeah. it meant pushes you. But how does, how does it feel being surrounded by people who are doing so well and maybe you, and this is where I, I am at now and was at then is I took a step back and be like, I'm betting on myself. I'm going to build something myself and being surrounded by people who are maybe ahead of you in the game and like, does that mess with your mental or does it, does it, does it motivate you? Which it should, Yes. but does it also mess with you and make you feel less about yourself? I mean, I think if at first it, it's tough, yeah, it's tough. I wouldn't say that it, it makes me feel less about myself. I, I, I think that maybe it took me a long time to get to a point. Um, I think I'm at a point where I can see someone who's doing better than me and I can, and I can see, you know, maybe what are they doing that I, that I should be doing that I'm not doing good enough. But a lot, of, a lot of times it's not as uh, not as apparent. You look at someone who's putting less effort in YouTube videos and you're like, why are they getting more views? Yeah. You, you look at, you know, everyone who creates clothing yeah. says that we have the best joggers in the world. <laughs> we These have, are we have the best joggers. The best <laughs> leggings in the world, <laughs> yeah. right? We have the best gym t-shirt. Yeah. When in reality, for the most part, let's let, let's just take the most generic thing that people make yeah. in clothing. 
T-shirts. The 95, five, 95% <laughs> cotton, 5% spandex gym T-shirt. Yep. You look at someone, you're like, my stuff is just as good mm-hmm. as this other brand. Yep. But they're selling 100,000 units of it and I'm selling 2,000. Does that mess with you or does it, it like push you? But when you get to this level where you are extremely successful and I know there's other people um, that we know who are light years more successful than we are. Yeah. It messes with my head, man. No, no, I know. and it, 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 But there's so many other factors, right? Yeah. There's like marketing. There's like the timing of a style coming out at the, the time that it's gaining popularity, like a broader market. So there's like certain things I feel like you can it's tough though, because you can replicate someone else's marketing strategy. You can see what they're doing for paid advertising. You can try and apply it yourself and you still won't have the same results as them. But yes, it, yes, it can, it can mess with my head. But at some point, this is where, this is why I got Marcus Aurelius in my arm. You can only focus on the things like you have control over. And that doesn't mean that I don't get stressed out and anxious about those things. I try and bring myself back to that. And as someone who kind of went all in on yourself, you have a very, very small team, right? Yep. Right. You're, you're someone that's similar to me that I don't know if it's, ignorant of us or naive of us to think that we can continue to do it all by ourselves. And you look at people around you, yep. you see how massive their team is yep. and you see how successful they are. Yep. And you almost are like, I wonder if that's a direct correlation because they scaled their team, they scaled their revenue and it makes sense. Yep. But you, you continue to think I can do it myself. I can do it myself. I can do all this. You're probably still doing a lot of things that you shouldn't be doing. <laughs> yeah. You don't outsource. Yeah. Right you still edit and film 99% of your YouTube videos. Yep. And with edge clothing, along with a lot of your other businesses, you're adding the products to the website. Well, not, I'm not doing that anymore. You're not doing that anymore. No, no, you're still doing that. On I'm four, still right? doing that, man. That, <laughs> that's right. You leveled up, dude. That was recently you just started doing that, right? I still go add the descriptions in, but someone else actually creates the product. Right. And so, so I guess, why do you continue to have this smaller team rather than like quickly quickly uh, um, giving out tasks to people to, to, you know, delegating tasks out to people. Why do you try to do everything yourself? I think, I mean, I, to be fair, I think over the last couple of years, I've, I've gotten more comfortable hiring people or at least like outsourcing like things to agencies, like paid advertising, managing right. the paid advertising or managing like the email marketing, things like that. Um, th- there's this, there's some element though, where in the past I've hired people to do certain things and like clearly the progress, not the progress, like the quality of that task is like degraded. And then no one can do anything as good as I can. That's like your mindset, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's tough, right? Because you have to think like, what are the things that I can do the best? What are the things I can outsource to other people? But a lot of times, I don't know for you, but for me, I'm just so busy keeping up with my set of tasks that I don't even have the the perspective to know which are the ones to hand off to other people. Right. And I feel like I've handed off a lot of tasks versus where I was at two years ago. Still, I feel like, and I know you do too, like it feels like we're drowning on, on a day-to-day basis, but it's a lot of it's like not even having the perspective, like which are the ones to give away that aren't gonna cause everything to crumble. Right. And and we keep adding more stress and more stress to our life. And the thing we keep doing is I still gotta make two YouTube videos a week. You got That's it. good. I'm going to add so many things to my plate, but nothing is going to mess with my YouTube uploads. Right. Yeah. And so kind of the last thing, yeah. uh, like with every YouTube or uh, with every podcast I do, there's a lot of stuff that I didn't get to get to. Yeah. Didn't get to get to. Um, I really wanted to dive into your other businesses because David has a lot of, you have a, a coaching program. Not, I'm, just talk, I'm not talking about fitness, a, a dating coaching, yep. right? Yep. Extremely successful. A lot of, and then a lot of things related to fitness, but I think that'll be safe for a, a part two. The last kind of like short little topic I want to get on is who is your number one partner in your business that assists with the most amount of things? That's Julia, of course. So Julia, Julia if you guys didn't know, is his lovely fiance who's sitting behind in the studio right now. And working with your significant other is something that I have never experienced. Yep. To be honest, when I used to work in a desk job, we'll call it nine to five. And one of my friends, I would see people at one point, there was one of my friends, but, um, I would see people who had relationships in the office Yep. and I would think what an idiot, right? <laughs> because I'm like, why would you, what, what is like, you, where you, you shit where you work, right? Yep. You know, they, 
go to the office together, they they work together, they go to lunch together, they leave the office together, they go home together, they sleep together, they wake up together, they walk, go to the office, they spend every single night. I'm like, you have never had time by yourself. And you have, I, I wouldn't say brought Julia into your businesses, but I think it just probably naturally happened yep. that she started assisting. And now Julia um, is a key component to everything that you do. Yep. Right. And so she, and I think, how do you balance having a relationship and being every single business, every single factor of your livelihood, y- your, your, y'all's livelihood, yep. um, the fact that, that she's a big component of that, like how do you balance a relationship and that she's your right-hand partner in it? How do you, how do you like separate that and kind of bring it together? It's tough. I wish, I mean, I don't, I don't have the answer. I'll right? say that it did happen very organically because it was like she was so she her background's in therapy she has her master's and she was working as a school as a therapist and this is after youtube had started to grow this is after we had started edge and it was at a point where she wasn't super happy with the the school she was working at the job she was working at and i was at the point where i had to hire somebody yeah and it and that's when like it just kind of felt like an organic thing hey you could we could try and do this and kind of what's led to the progression of us hiring people has been like, as I get to points where it's like, okay, we're drowning, there's things we can't do between me and Julia. Then we hire someone and they tend to take over like a combination of some things Julia's doing, some things I'm doing. And then we like continue on and say, oh, we're drowning again. And that's how we hire the next person. But to answer your question, we do work together. We do live together. And we have to make big efforts, you know, particularly on the weekends. Like I, I, this last weekend, I think was a PR for us. Where yeah. like Saturday and Sunday, we worked in the mornings, but both days from like 11 a.m. to the end of the day, we didn't work. And it, it's tough. What were you doing? Watching movies or something? Well, this is that we went. I think we hung out with some friends by the pool uh, one the whole, day. The whole time David's at the pool, David just is lay, laying, soaking up sun, and in the, his mind is like, "All right, the edge is coming up. Uh, are you gonna make these YouTube video? Uh, are I think the shipment's coming in later? That's what's going on in your head, right? It one, never stops. One, yeah, one hundred percent, man. But it's I guess it's in those moments finding uh, like the self control not to put that that stress yeah. on Julie in that in that moment at least, and then to try and be present with what we're doing. But it's tough, right? It's trying to find time. We're like, okay, we're not going to do work now, but I don't have the answer. And here's a question that I think it's going to be kind of a banger. Okay. I think this will be a, a big question for you. Okay. Because you brought Julia into, into the realm of all of your businesses, right? And she's assists with everything. Yep. And these are your businesses. How do you, as her partner, and as the owner of these businesses, like how do you make sure that you don't make her feel like her world is revolved around your life and your businesses and the successes that you and you try to make sure that these are our victories and not just these are my businesses, you're helping me with my businesses that I started. Because that's probably gotta have a big weight because maybe in the back of her head, she might feel like, a lot of things that I do are revolved around David's life. Yep. Whereas instead of like, hey, you know, hey, like don't don't worry about go getting this job doing this, like really assist with me because we can take this to the moon, yep. right? Um, how do you kind of like balance that? Because I don't know if that's something that I could probably handle, like, you know, to, to make someone, because there's a lot of external and internal thoughts that can maybe go yep. into that. That is a banger of a question. It's a good question. Um, mm. I mean, luckily she's taken such an active interest in certain aspects of the business that it, it it's never been like a big issue it, it has been an issue from time to time it's something that, that has caused conflict from time to time but she's taken a huge interest in different parts of the businesses and she oftentimes comes up with like she's funny we always joke but she's, she's super creative she doesn't think she's creative but a lot of times she comes up with like creative solutions yeah. and problems and things um it so it's i don't know if that's a direct answer but it's uh, it's been something that like luckily it doesn't it's never felt like she's an employee and, and I'm yeah. the owner. Um, it's 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 felt like she's like a, another part of my brain, I guess, and that she's she's actively taking an interest uh, in towards the growth of the businesses. That being said, it, I, I think also at the end of the day, um, you know, she manages like our whole life. Yeah, because my mind is lost in the businesses constantly. I kind of as you as you're yeah. making a joke about, like, my mind is constantly lost in what's going on next in the businesses, and she's the person who 
who not just like takes care of the dogs, but like grounds us in reality and makes sure that our life on a day to day basis, like logistically, isn't isn't falling apart. Right. So like we wouldn't be able to like things in general like if, if our life fell apart the businesses wouldn't it wouldn't matter you know so it's yeah. like there's a there's also a key balance there you, so you, you try to ensure that it's it's a, a joint venture that you're creating together not necessarily like my fiance helps me with my business it's my fiance and i are building an empire together yep 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 exactly. and that's that's amazing and and kind of the final thing just to super bring it back full circle here is that do you feel that you would have the success in your life that you have now if you did not open your heart and meet your significant other? I know she's sitting behind you, but like, do you feel that you would have the same level of success if you didn't meet the right person that changed your mindset on dating, your thoughts about relationships? Like, like what do you, what, you know, how do you feel about that? I mean, it's, it's like, it's, it's funny that we met literally months before I made this commitment to YouTube and she's been a part of the journey since the beginning. Um, I know it's funny on the, on the, on the Christian podcast, you guys were talking that, that Rob always says every decision we've made up until this point led us to where we are. So for sure, if I hadn't met Julia, things would not have played out as they did. Yeah. It's like by definition, right? Like that changed the, the course of my life and it's been not just someone I'm deeply in love with and deeply attracted to, but has been someone who's played, um, who's not just been supportive. Is that something when, before things were, you, you know, I know recently when you were single, you were already at a successful stage. Right. Looking to to date. And that creates its own set of circumstances that you maybe you're afraid women are, like you talked about, alluded to earlier, women are taking advantage of you. But I was someone who was, when I was most recently single before Julia, I was, had started my own path, but was anything but successful. And that was something that came up a lot on, on dates with girls that were like, yeah. didn't understand like, what the hell is this guy doing? And, and I don't think it was, it wasn't like an attractive thing to girls at the time. And Julia was someone from day one, you know, was ride or die, supported all those things. And that's something that's, that's special. Yeah, no, I, and I agree. And I think that you are the prime example of someone that has a passion for something, delivered that passion to your to your audience, and you've kind of opened a lot of guys' eyes in terms of understanding that you don't have to think so negatively about the idea of monogamy, relationships. Um, not everything is about kind of chasing the next girl, right? And as you get older, you kind of more understand that. And I think that people people seeing you and seeing your path of success and how much you've accomplished and doing it all with, by falling in love with a girl and her kind of changing your mindset and, you know, helping you build the empire that you guys have created together. I think it's a beautiful thing, man. And it's just, it, it's, it's inspiring to me to see, I, I look to you and Julia, and I've told you this before that you guys, you know, you not only inspire me on a content creation level and a business and your mindset, because I've never seen anyone who I guess is so it's, you're like, I'm going to get everything done and I'm going to make sure that I output the, the highest quality like content that I do, but you're so business focused with having such a small team. And it reminds me so much of myself and it really puts me into my place whenever I think about kind of slacking because I'm like, David is almost, you're almost in the same position. You have a very small team, you have a lot going on and you still make sure you have your priorities and you're doing it all while having an amazing relationship with someone. And um, yeah, you and Julia have really, really motivated me. I don't know if motivation is the right word, but um, you've shown me what a good relationship looks like. And you've shown me that you can have a healthy relationship, continue to build get that person involved and have a, I, I use the word empire. I, I think it's kind of tacky to use, but build this empire together. And um, yeah, I just, I, I, I don't know if I, you've ever been like relationship goals, but like your happiness with Julia is something that uh, has really helped me in my kind of like relationship journey. You're making me tear up, man. No, it's, it's just but, but it's, you, hearing that from you. I was like, things have come full circle because you're one of my, 
far before we met in Alpha, the old Alpha Lee gym, far yeah. before then, I, I followed your content. And you're one of my biggest inspirations on YouTube, top three for sure. To be honest, dude, I'll, I'll tell you something. Every time that I upload a YouTube video that I consider the lazy YouTube video, there wasn't a lot of effort. Do, do you want to know every, who, every single person that says, I don't care about that, I don't care about all the fluff? Do you want to know the first thing that I think of is that when David watches my video, <laughs> he's going to be like, Max has fallen off. Max has fallen off. Like, I'm not even kidding, bro. Like you, you are one of the few people that inspire me because I know the effort that you put in your content on every single video that you inspire me to like keep on my game. The inspiration is mutual. Absolutely, man. Well, I think this is a, a good wrap up. Um, again, I say this on every single podcast. There was a lot that I really wanted to get to. Would love to have you back. And uh, yeah, I think this was a, an amazing episode. Is there anything kind of coming up that uh, you kind of want to leave the people with wondering about you? The supplement brand will be launching, because I know when this is going up, within a few weeks after this. Can you say the name? I don't think I can say it yet. Can't say the name <laughs> yet. You're going to have to find yet. out. But uh, where can they find you on the social? How to Beast. Just search that? Yeah, T-O. A lot of people like it too. No, it's T-O spelled out. How to Beast, any social. And, well, uh, and, and again, I'm going to link actually all of your businesses. So... Dating coaching, again, hopefully a lot of guys who watch this really are like, this guy knows what the fuck he's talking about. He's, but I, cause I used to think, you know, he's in a relationship. How can he give advice to guys trying to get girls? And your, your advice is good. Thank you. It really is good. So I'm gonna put, he has dating coaching, um, a lot of fitness stuff and an amazing clothing company, Edge. I'm gonna put that down there. And um, yeah, man, I, I really appreciate having you on. We're about to go get some dinner after this, some sushi. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're getting this, but David is one of my best friends. We've become super, super close. And if there's anyone that puts out content that I think you should watch because of the effort that is, that is put into it, it is this man right here. Thank you, bro. But that will conclude episode number four of the Don't Be Sour show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Make sure on whatever streaming platform you're watching, you subscribe, leave a rating, leave a comment. These videos, the, these podcast videos, shows are meant to be watched. Make sure you go on the YouTubes. If you're just listening to it, you're going to get a whole different experience. And I can't wait to see you guys on the next one. Until then, don't be sour, dude. Boom. Boom. That was a, that was a good one, dude. Oh, you, you, really, you, <laughs> you, you really do get like locked in. It, you do. You're laser focused. Yeah, it's yeah. like a, no, a no, tractor no. beam, man. I could have talked talk for like hours like that. <laughs> it's good, yeah. Solid potter, dude. Do it again. All right. They're come back for episode two, bro. <laughs> That's awesome. Hell yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That was a good time.